And oh, sorry, it's Steve D. Okay, you have it on the screen. We'll start right about now. Hey, this is Deacon Jonathan Stewart with Talk Gnosis. Today we're sp uh, speaking to uh, writer, uh, therapist, uh, magician, blogger, Steve D. Uh, about his book, Agnostics Progress, and about a whole bunch of other things. Hello, Steve. Hello. Hi, John. Nice to see you. Uh, it, it's awesome seeing you, and uh, I'm really excited to do this interview. I, I, this is how I open like every talk gnosis about realizing it, and, and I don't mean to sound obsequious, but what it is is we book really amazing guests, <laughs> right? So that's why if you're if you're binge watching the show and you're like, wow, this guy, this host really loves sucking up to his guests, it's because we get guests who are worth sucking up to. Steve, I, I know that your book is. You know, a couple of years old, and maybe we'll be talking. And you'll be like, "I hate Gnosticism now. That's a dumb book. I, I wish I had never written it." But uh, you know, I only recently read it, and I'm sad that I didn't find it when it came out. Uh, and even though it's it's a slim volume, and folks, it's it's a mercifully slim volume, right? <laughs> I'm sure if you're interested in this stuff, you've read lots of volumes that aren't slim. Um, but it's uh, it, it's really it, it's really an important book. It's an enjoyable book. It's a thought provoking book, and I think anybody interested in in modern Gnosticism. Uh, uh, should read it and if you're watching this then you know that's you and also it's you could read it in a couple sittings and it's like i think five dollars on kindle or something in in american or canadian funds um so steve that's that's my commercial for you i'm very quickly going to do a commercial for us which is patreon.com slash gnostic uh we can't do the show without your financial support you could donate for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month you get some perks like early access to the shows some special streaming stuff access to the discord and we're always trying to do more for our patrons let us know if there's something we can do for you nobody ever responds to that but you know if you want me to come over and do your dishes if you are in traveling distance to me we'll do it because uh, we don't want to do what most podcasts and uh, youtube shows do which is lock up some content behind a paywall right we uh want to get all of this out um you can also do one-time donations at paypal.com slash gnostic and of course if you can't help us out financially we completely understand uh these are difficult times it's a difficult world it's a gnostic world but you can also tell people about the show you can share it on your social media uh, you can rate and review us. You can subscribe. Uh, take your favorite episode. Just email it to a friend. It's probably going to be this episode. Be like, here, listen to this. Read this book by Steve D. Steve, um, I guess we should start with, if you could tell us a, a bit about your journey and your story, like some of your biography and, and what it is in your background and your biography that kind of got you interested in <clears throat> occultism and Gnosticism. Sure. No problem. Um I think um, I was quite uh, an early starter in, in terms of kind of my spiritual journey, probably around the age of um, 10 or 11. Um, my mum had done some yoga when she was pregnant with me. And so there was a yoga book lying around the house. And um, I was kind of curious about these kind of speedo clad, leotard clad. You know, you've got to think about the era of the um, early 70s these yogis doing their postures and I thought oh yeah I'll give that a go and um, so much to the um, amusement of my father who who was a bricklayer you know so a real kind of working class champion um, I was falling all over the lounge room breaking out my moves um, and that and that interest in yoga got me um, sent me down a rabbit hole as an early teen um, Kind of interested in yoga i lived on the gold coast in um in australia and there were lots of people like hari krishnas and um some kind of uh raja yoga type folks um so i kind of got into all of that and got interested in that simultaneously um there were lots of kind of christians of an evangelical variety um in my community and i became friendly with some of them and it was through that that I was exposed to Christianity pretty much for the first time because I don't come from a Christian household, only in a really nominal sense. So um, I never went to Sunday school. So I was hearing about you know, the good news and all of that sort of stuff. Um, and not really understanding Christianity kind of made some sort of commitment to it, but I was still... Um, kind of mixing together my Hinduism with my Christianity in quite a happy way. Um, and then my family moved back to the UK. I was probably about 16. Um, and I got very involved with a, an evangelical church. Um, and 
very deeply involved in Christian faith. Um, at, to the extent that I decided to go and do an undergraduate degree at a um, conservative seminary uh, in London. Um, and I did that uh, and then um, proceeded to have a bit of a nervous breakdown as I tried to work out you know, the claims of exclusivity of Christianity. And at the same time, I came across um, that great Hexenmeister, um, Carl Jung, in the pastoral studies components of my theology degree. And Jung really opened a doorway to thinking about a lot of things, the shadow, the collective unconsciousness, um, archetypes, but also about Gnosticism. Um, you know, about the, the Jung Codex of the Nag Hammadi Library. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, um, I started digging into that material, um, all the while still considering myself a fairly mainstream Christian. Um, but my partner um, lost her faith um, in her early 20s, and um, it kind of set me on a journey of really thinking about what I believed and about the crisis that I had when I went to um, seminary. And I gradually became more interested in Western magic, um, especially the Kabbalah and Tarot. And from there, um, and, and alongside that sort of esoteric Christianity and Gnosticism, um, and at the same time, I was looking at the intersect between those things and contemporary paganism um, as a practitioner and also um, the kind of phenomena in the UK at the time that was pretty popular um, known as chaos magic. So, yeah, it was a, um, a fairly steep journey into thinking about esoteric things. Um, and, you know, and friends have said to me, um, did I lose my faith? Um, it's a good question. I think I think I, I see it as an expansion of faith rather than a loss of, but I certainly don't view things in the same terms that I used to when I was a, a 19, 20 year old. That's for certain. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit? So, so in a way, Gnosticism through Jung um, is is perhaps one of the doors that kind of brought you to to where you're at now. Um, but can you talk about kind of engaging more of Gnosticism over the last couple of years, the the writing of the of your book? And I am curious because you know the book came out in 2016, so yeah, that's about right. About right, five so, years ago. Somehow that's yeah. Somehow that's five years ago already. Um, so, so I'm also curious about like where you're at now, right? Like uh, the, you know, if you can kind of talk about the the progress that <laughs> that this Gnostic pilgrim has made in the last five years. So um, yeah, so uh, go off. Yeah, sure. Um, so thinking about what triggered the process of um, of writing that book and reflecting on those issues. Um, so as you're probably aware, John, you know, chaos magic um, as a form of contemporary magical practice is very fascinated with the power of belief to influence um, magical outcomes or, or esoteric outcomes. And so the practitioner moves between various paradigms or worldviews in order to um, kind of uh, actualize or intensify certain aspects of the self. Um, and because of the place of Christianity and Gnosticism in my own history, um, you know, I eventually got to thinking, OK, well, how do I how do I reconsider some of the Christian ideas and imagery and Gnosticism specifically, but through a kind of chaos magical lens? Could that be done? Um, I, ha I, I hadn't seen anything out there like that. And so over a two year period preceding the book coming out, I started blogging about these issues on the blog um, that I share with uh, Julian Vane and Nikki Weird um, called the blog of baphomet.com. Uh, and so I started blogging about these issues over about a two year period. And then at the end of those two years, I thought I've probably got enough pieces that I could kind of um, kind of knit them together and and add some stuff um, just to try and present a more kind of um, future orientated uh, exploration of Gnosticism. Because when I was looking at 
the contemporary Gnostic scene and what people were doing, um, especially in America, it's very, um, it's very church focused. It's very kind of ecclesiologically focused. And um, whereas I understand culturally that that probably works better in North America because of the emphasis of, on church, um, that's not such a thing in the UK and certainly not in esoteric circles. You don't find a lot of esoteric churches um, with perhaps um, the exception of the liberal Catholic church. Um, yeah, so, so that's kind of what got me to write the book, kind of exploring those themes. Um, in terms of where I've got to now, um, again, that's a good question. Um, I think by disposition, I'm, I'm quite, um, quite a, an introvert, like so many Gnostics, I suppose. Um, but I, I'm also quite quietist in my practice so i think i'm rather than being into the sort of high liturgy of maybe the liberal catholic tradition or um the french gnostic church or um the johannite church i'm i'm kind of probably ecclesiologically closer to being a quaker so i'm i'm, I'm very interested in contemplative practice and i really um enjoyed the podcast by tom given when i was looking at your archives uh, on um, contemplative practice and Gnosticism. So that was a good one. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm really interested in the new monastic impulse, uh, which is largely a Christian one, although you have some interesting intersects with the work of people like Bede Griffiths uh, and Wayne Teasdale, who are kind of that in that interspiritual world. So I'm quite interested in that. Um, so I'm sort of exploring my Gnosticism through kind of meditative work. Um, though I do have connections, um, a, a, a good friend of mine in the UK, because there's not a lot of Gnostics, um, is um, Bishop Pamela Gisi, who is, um, is a bishop within um, Eglise Gnostique Apostolique, um, the French Gnostic Church. So I kind of have connections there, although I'm not I'm a clergy person, I'm, I'm a lay person. So yeah, so I'm, I've kind of been continuing to explore those meditative approaches um, and, and working with others um, in, in the context of this church with Bishop Pam. Um, yeah, so it's kind of ongoing. So, so to answer your question, I haven't um, thought, well, I'm done with that, um, but it is interesting. I think you, you highlight something interesting that as a writer, often, the book, a book can be the end product of a journey mm -hmm. and people ask you, oh, I really like that thing you wrote five years ago and, and you've moved on. But I still I, I still seem to be digging into that territory and finding lots to learn from and explore. Uh, and I'm certainly having lots of interesting dialogue with people, perhaps who are more involved with um, paganism and trying to work out where the intersect is between contemporary pagan things and com contemporary Gnostic things. Yeah. Yeah, well, it, my own background is is you know, one of uh, Christian contemplation, right? And being involved with the, the Christian meditation movement. So uh, that, 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 that Quaker Gnosticism definitely appeals to me as well. And uh, the, as you know from our archives, like that show that you mentioned, it is uh, something we've, we've explored on the show, something I've explored in my own practice. Um, some of the intersections between stuff like centering prayer and Gnosticism, or even Dzogchen and Gnosticism. I know Dzogchen is very trendy right now, but I find it works quite well uh, with uh, with Gnosticism. Can you speak a little bit more? It, this is a, a bit of a difficult question to articulate, as so many of these things are. But like Gnostic meditation, Gnostic contemplation, being different from other forms of Christian contemplation, if they are in any ways. We've talked a little bit on the show of, of you know, using Secret John as a, as a contemplative guide, right, to, to showing you what's going on in the internal world. So that, that's sort of one sort of practical sense that we are, quote unquote, doing Gnostic meditation or looking at the insights and practices of the Gnostics for our contemplative practice. Uh, practices do you do, do you have something like that or 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 something you can say on on that topic yeah i i think i think what's interesting is the whole um the different footing that a gnostic starts on compared to an orthodox believer um you know i'm, I'm not saying that there aren't spiritual technologies within orthodox christianity and i mean orthodox in the broadest sense not 
um, Russian Orthodox. Um, so, you know, you do have things like, um, you know, um, the use of the Jesus prayer and the use of breathing in the Jesus prayer uh, and the use of the body through, um, you know, prostra prostrations and things like that. Um, but I think the difference for me as a, as a Gnostic, uh, although I don't describe myself, I don't use the word Christian. Um, that's a very personal thing because of my own journey. But, um, but I think the Gnostic is overtly interested in the technologies of change and um, using symbolic language and symbolic ideas um, yeah to to transform the self and so if we have this idea of a divine spark located within the self that can be um, the sacred flame you know that can be fanned into a greater degree of um, heat and transformative power, alchemical power, um, then I believe that the Gnostic will be trying to cultivate those practices. And um, yeah, I suppose I suppose what's interesting is the moment we start thinking about Western Gnosticism and the history of Western Gnosticism before the discovery of the Nag Hammadi um, texts, you know, the the Johannite and the French Gnostic traditions were hugely influenced by um, Kabbalistic and Martinist and you know um, the the broad Hermetic corpus of of techniques and traditions. So yeah, it's hard to think specifically. I think I think you're right. There are some Sethian. I think it's in in, in Brake's book about um, the Gnostics. He talks about the you know the the five kind of um, baptisms and the five seals, and you know you could you could see those as as being kind of um, similar to something like the chakra system in a sense of you know are these are these um, aonic forces are they aonic gateways or are they archonic gateways are they blockages or, or are they opportunities. Um, and I think working overtly with them, I've done some some working um, with that. Um, and but I think when I've been exploring it, I've been aware of my own kind of process of hybridization um, with some things from you know alchemical ideas and even um, Hindu tantric ideas. Um, so. Yeah, it's probably not very satisfying for a Gnostic purist if there is such a thing, but um, I certainly think there are ways of opening up the self overtly in order to um, experience God working from the inside out. Yeah, that's probably a, a way of looking at it that, you know, that the Gnostic will be interested in technologies that that fan the divine within uh at, in all levels, you know, both emotional, physical, psychological, intellectual. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And we'll come back to hybridization, uh, I, I hope. And uh, definitely, there are definitely Gnostic purists, and I, I definitely hear from them. So they <laughs> will probably see them in the YouTube comments of this of That's said fine. show. Yeah, yeah, bring it on. <laughs> but, but we'll come back to that because uh, the, something I really want to get to, make sure we get to, is uh, 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 you have uh, quite a lot of interesting uh, content in the book about the demiurge, right? Mm -hmm. And, you, you know, I think, uh, and that, that's one of the hooks, one of the mythological concepts that uh, a lot of people are grabbed by when it comes to Gnosticism, even, of course, people who are not Gnostics or would never be Gnostics or, or who are atheists and are perhaps using the mythology with, within art. And in, there is sort of a... Um, and I understand, particularly for people who come from an abusive Christian background, right? How you can sort of work out your issues with God through the figure of the demiurge. But I also notice um, a lot, I shouldn't say a lot, but um, plenty, many, many people interested in Gnosticism, many people new to Gnosticism, really kind of view the demiurge as like uh, in, in, in fantasy novel terms, right? This is, this is Sauron. You know, the Lord of the Rings, like this is this is ultimate mm -hmm. evil, like this is an actual figure. And really what you're doing is is missing all the nuance. And all of a sudden, you know, the demiurge is just the devil, right? And we're kind of into a weird, unconscious uh, evangelical Christianity where the demiurge is the devil and runs the world, which is, you know, what 
evangelical say. So I, I was wondering if you, if you could sort of share some of your your thought processes on there. Just uh, talk about the, the demiurge as, as the whipping boy, um, the, uh, as our scapegoat. But also, you have a really nice phrase in there about about the demiurge being the messy reality of creation, right? And and as a writer, I really know that because, you know, like like I, I procrastinate on creative writing because I know what is in my head will never be, won't be as good as what I create, right? Mm -hmm. um, therefore, I don't create because creation is much more uh, messy and hard and it won't be perfect. So the, perhaps I'm giving away some of your insights by, by sharing <laughs> that little bit of artistic uh, 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 process and insight. But uh, uh, Steve, take it away. Okay, so I, I mean, I, I think I think for me, you know, one of the, you know, wh why did Gnosticism develop, or, or what what why, what was one of the impulses um, behind Gnosticism, and actually one of the the impulses behind most theological or philosophical endeavor, and it's to do with the problem of evil or theodicy, and. And so, you know, the early Gnostics were trying to understand um, the disparity or the apparent disparity between um, the, the good father, um, heavenly father that Jesus described in the gospels and our experience of suffering in the world and pain in the world. And so, you know, and that's an issue that you know theological schools and philosophical schools and different religions have struggled with you know time immemorial so um so the gnostics were doing that and um you know as we know you know when when people are trying to describe what gnosticism is as a contemporary religious movement there can be a tendency to as you say kind of um see see the scapegoat um see the demiurge as the scapegoat but also um, being quite oversimplistic, I think, in um, their use of Gnostic sources and, you know, especially things like the Apocryphon of John and a lot of the Sethian material, which we know is much more radically dualist. Um, so um, what I was really interested in was, OK, where's this idea of the Demiurge come from and um, you know, is there is there a, is there some nuance there? Is there some complexity there? And certainly, my reading of it was that there is. You know, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I really love um, Stefan Howler's work, as uh, as most people interested in Gnosticism um, do. And um, you know, in his work, his book Gnosticism, I think he talks about a lot of Platonic ideas influencing, especially the Valentinian school of gnosticism so um yeah i got to thinking about that and and thinking about the dilemma of, that we face you know in our era of um in a post-industrial or an in, you know, industrial post-industrial society how we're thinking about ecological crisis um and is there a way of understanding the created world um in a way that simultaneously sees that all is good and beautiful about that but also acknowledges um, our human experience of suffering and pain and um, and our own fears regarding our own death and mortality and impermanence so um, yeah I got interested in all of that and, and I suppose one of the books that really um, helped me uh, was um, Jeffrey Cooperman's book, um, Living Theurgy, um, which I'm sure a lot of listeners will know and, and enjoy. It's an excellent book. And so, you know, Jeffrey's exploring um, the kind of Neoplatonistic ideas um, regarding the Demiurge and how those evolved in the early um, centuries of um, Christianity in both pagan and then Christian sources, in which the demiurge is, is seen as the means of creation. So um, rather than being a, a, um, a deluded abortion um, from Sophia's folly, as you know, as the, uh, um, the Sethians would have, you know, the demiurge is the, the way in which um, the world is manifest, you know, the demiurge is the workman, 
Um, and so the world, I suppose that more kind of Neoplatonic idea, um, and that has some resonances with like, you know, early Gnostics like uh, Marcion. Um, the world is as it is because that's how it needs to be to run. It runs according to biological principles um, and it's beautiful, but also impermanent and at times terrifying. Um, but it isn't. Um, we can find God within it and through it, but even in its impermanence. So I think I was trying to capture a more kind of full bodied um, take on what the, who the Demiurge could be. Uh, but also, you know, Jeff, Jeff Cooperman's book, what's great about it is it also highlights that the type of eco spirituality that we associate with contemporary neo-paganism isn't necessarily the whole picture of of um, early paganism you know so early paganisms multiple often had a kind of quite complex experience of the imminent physical world especially in in the norse mythologies which have some quite gnostic aspects um but especially in the Neoplatonic. Yeah, so it's just trying to capture that idea that um, we are here and, the, and, our, and our consciousness means that we struggle with aspects of being here, that ennui that Gnostics love, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the material world is evil um, or to be disdained, you know, um, because most of us in reality live our lives as if it's generally a good thing. Yeah. And uh, in the book, you, you talk a little bit or you gain a little bit of inspiration, you know, not directly subscribing to all the ideas, obviously, but from the, the, the Saturn fraternity, fraternity <laughs> to use an anglicism, the, the German organization, yeah. um, about some of their unique views of, of the Demiurge uh, and the, the Saturnine uh, um, aspects of the Demiurge and, and actually how the Demiurge is this spurring for for growth can you speak a, a bit to, a little bit about that inspiration and how you deal with that in the book yeah i mean that's that's more a passing reference really but i, I think you know and, and my my working knowledge although i have friends who are involved with the contemporary manifestations of um the fraternity of saturn um you know i my, my own knowledge of it isn't extensive beyond you know what's available in english but the, the idea is that Saturn is a demiurge figure um, and a gateway. So there's this idea that this dark, apparently dark thing is, um, is actually a gateway to light. So, and, and you know, for those of us interested in kind of trickster deities uh, and even tricks, the, tris, the trickster aspects of Christ, um, you know, we see that what apparently seems dark um, is uh, is the gateway to, to light. And, and for the Gnostic, we often have to go through those those dark phases of alchemy. You know what they call the alchemists often called negredo, the the blackening um, that we move through that in order to ascend. So, and you know, thinking about it in Jungian terms we could see that as being like the integration of the shadow, you know, or at least understanding and integrating aspects of the shadow. So, um, and I think that's certainly something that differentiates for me, Gnosticism from, you know, more mainstream belief in that, that duality that you've already mentioned between God and the devil um, isn't as straightforward. And, you know, we have a lot of that kind of, um, Orphidian Gnostic tradition in which the serpent of the garden is is a form of Christ or you know or the light bringer um, so yeah what, what what can appear to be dark and foreboding is actually uh, a powerful way of accessing ultimately greater light so yeah I think I think that's what I was getting at and also I think I there's a bit in the book that looks at some of the mythology of the process church of the final judgment mm. um, 
and the way in which they used uh, the images of, I think it was uh, Lucifer uh, and Satan. Um, I can't remember if they used Baphomet. They, you had, they had Baphomet imagery, but I can't remember if they used Baphomet. And they also used Christ. So, you know, the, 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 the acknowledgement that different people were going to be drawn to different ways of working. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, because you because you brought them up, um, uh, you you have a great line in the book about uh, Abraxas and Baphomet jabbing at your, and and that really spoke to me because I know exactly what you're talking about. You know, I have my Baphomet here. Uh, those that know me or, or have met me in real life know that I I have a variety of Abraxas pins. I usually wear them out in public, um, and, and that's just it because these figures, even from a very early age. Right, like obviously we, we we know Baphomet from 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 pop culture, usually associated with Satanism, and of course that that's a big mistake. But um, uh, at least in, in the way that it's used in horror movies, if you see Baphomet in a horror movie or a comic book or something. Um, but from a very early age, both of these figures have have intrigued me, um, uh, capture my imagination, and continue to do so. So I'm wondering if you could, and of course you know with the, the blog that that you do with your uh, uh, with your magical comrades is called the the blog of Baphomet. Uh, mm. Can you talk a little bit about why you think you find these these figures intriguing? Why they they speak to your unconscious um, and and what they mean for you, kind of practically in, in your work as 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 a mystic, as a gnostic, as a magician? Sure. Yeah. Um, I think for me, the attraction to both Baphomet and Abraxas are is is in their kind of primary visual iconography. Um, and, and both of them are these chimeric deities who are hybrids of a whole range of things. You know, they are, they are holding shields and they have writhing serpentine legs, you know, and they have cockerel heads and they have, um, they hold together simultaneously, you know, the animal and the reptile and the human, um, the male and the female, the left and the right. So, um, for me, they both represent icons of balance. Um, there's a very famous um, form of Shiva um, from Tantric Hinduism called Adhanarisvara, which is part Shiva and part um, Parvati. And, and in some ways, there's a kind of resonance with, with Abraxas and Baphomet as a balancing kind of alchemical image. Um, and for me, I think there's a kind of fluidity to their um, their depictions that, that for me speaks about process theology as well. You know, the idea that um, our, our understanding of the divine, of the mystery, of the numinous is, is evolving and it is evolving personally, but also across scriptural traditions. I personally believe it's evolving collectively um and um so these images represent that unfolding and i think that's why they are so powerful for me um and also they represent um i suppose without sounding too cheeky they are obviously humanly constructed as well so you know there's no um there's no claims to that these weren't made up by somebody and I like the idea that our gods or the, our images of the divine are co-constructed um, with the divine. Um, and also that, and I think I talk about this a little bit in the book, that um, that our own, my, so my best understanding of the divine today in a few years time may become decidedly demiurgic in the sense that it's outdated um that it's bastardized that it's um that it, it, it's something if i hang on to um I, I will probably be limiting my own initiation so so to ask you know to answer your question um what do the, what role do these icons play in my own magical work i think they are um a bit like hermes um mercury um they are they are prompts to keep moving, to keep exploring, uh, and to be authentic. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I think that's one of the, the central messages of Gnosticism is this 
this call that in 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 that you have to always be pushing forward that you always have to be journeying that uh that your your idea of god as you said you know five years ago ten years ago uh the uh, uh, uh maybe later considered demiurgic um in the book, uh, this is a question, uh, again, this isn't really a question instead of just pointing at you and requesting for you to speak because I don't quite have the intellectual background to discuss with you. But lately on the show, for the whole time on the show, people interested in Gnosis, occultism, we, there's so much to know just if we're sticking with the second century and then in the 19th century, right? If we're mm -hmm. just trying to get a handle of the tradition. So let alone if you didn't take philosophy at, at school, trying to, to make these connections and these and viewing Gnosticism through these other hermeneutic lenses, which I, which I think is quite important for doing Gnosticism in the modern world. But I, in the book, you, you talk about Heidegger, and I'm wondering if you can elaborate a little bit about you know, what insights Heidegger might have for, for a Gnostic. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to, now, now this is really testing my memory, because <laughs> I wrote about that five years ago. Um, but I, I think, you know, um, a couple of, I think, I think I can speak to a couple of things. And one of, and one of them is about, um, you know, existentialism as a um, contemporary way of framing um, Gnostic exploration and trying to find an authentic life um and you know so that so in you know i think it's in heidegger that the idea of mood is really important and the subtlety of um our felt sense of something so you know often and i don't know if you feel this john but you know if someone's asking you what it is to be a Gnostic you know you're thinking oh yeah that's that's really tough you know to to pin it down to a an elevator speech about what Gnosticism is but but it's a sense of um kind of curiosity and for me there's parallels with my kind of therapeutic work in that in in the sense that um you know to be a Gnostic means to be curious and and I think um when 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 we're talking about heidegger and we're thinking about mood and that felt sense of what it means to be a gnostic um you know it, it's it's a challenge really to um the danger of which we're all prone to of, of creating a new orthodoxy about what it is to be gnostic you know and i understand why people are drawn to kind of things like creedal statements and you know in that stefan Hoeller book that i've already mentioned you know he has a stab at saying you know what are these 12 principles that we that we could identify for people who are claiming to be gnostics um which is kind of based on the early material and, and you know that, that's that's bold um but there's a danger isn't there that we um especially if we get very invested in the ecclesiological forms or ecclesiastical i should say forms of gnosticism that um it can kind of calcify and um i suppose the challenge for me looking at christian history is um and understanding something about the 19th century and those occult revivals is uh, in france is um you know why why we would choose this form of high Catholicism um, as our kind of um, as our rubric for esoteric work, um, and you know, and and so that's a challenge, you know. Um, yeah, and, and I haven't got a good answer to that. Um, well, I've got a partial answer, but um, but it's it's interesting to think what will the Gnosticism of the future look like, you know? So. Um, rather than recreating one that was born in the 19th century. Um, yeah, so, or, or at, you know, at the fin de seal anyway. So yeah, it's gonna be, it's gonna be good to think about and ponder those questions. I, I agree. And, you know, obviously that it's something that I think about all the time, right? Being more involved with the class, uh, high church Nazism, right? Mm. <laughs> the, mm. the classical, uh, um, now I can't say it. Uh, 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 forms. Uh, I will tell you this: where where I'm at at with it, and uh, it, it will lead to a question, which is 
I guess in the past, perhaps I was more of quote unquote a purist, which is very silly because, you know, we have to make Gnosticism work for the 21st century. Um, uh, the high church Gnosticism is is a recreation based on the 1900s on the, uh, and the 1800s on the 19th century. Uh, you know, it's definitely not what the second century Gnostics are doing, even though there's going to be some similarities, particularly the mm. Valentinians. Um, but, but that said, I, I've become less of a purist and um much more of uh of just of just baptize it all and make it gnostic right <laughs> um which uh and, and and i actually would propose that the high church tradition allows us to do this even though this is counterintuitive which is because we have the liturgy as the sort of thing that that we can't screw around with too much it gives some cohesiveness everything outside of the liturgy uh is is go for it now this is not this is not a, a stance of the of the the oni church or even of my parish or of any particular organization right it's just me it's just me ranting just me going off so so you can do all these techniques and uh practices and incorporations of other mythologies well of course trying not to be culturally appropriative or, or be being too surface level or, you know, do too many things that other organizations like the TS did that I'm not a fan of, um, sort of outside of the liturgy. So doing it as working groups, doing it as prayer groups, doing it as meditation groups, doing it as um, creative uh, imagination work groups, doing it as shadow work groups. Is this making sense, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. It, but see, now we still have something that, that's cohesive, right? Something that keeps us all together and something that allows us all to explore Gnosticism or a form of Gnosticism, right? Where where we have this touchstone um, that, that allows us to, to have an organization and brings us together, right? Because, you know, that's what the Mass does at, at the end of the day. is it, 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 it brings, it unites us and, and the Logos, but it unites us into the body of Christ. Um, so uh so what do you think of that is question number one and then two is for like do you create boundaries for 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 your own personal gnosticism especially with your with your uh chaos magic background do you do we have to create boundaries how do we do this when when we have this this bounty uh this uh this cafeteria where we have all these spiritual technologies and knowing that the ancient gnostics of course combined everything from from greek philosophy to 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 egyptian paganism um mm. so yeah yeah, I, th I think I think your your point is a good one. That I think the danger is not in having high church forms of Gnosticism because I think they're really valid and powerful. Yes. Um, and I think also that going back to the idea of Neoplaton Neoplatonic theurgy, actually they, you know, as as Ledbetter argued, you know, with the liberal Catholic Church, these are highly ancient forms of. Um, magical practice so it would be kind of crazy to abandon them um i think the danger becomes when we only focus on those things and we don't allow these other practices and and i suppose what's interesting about those gnostic churches that make use of liturgy um they often are partnered with other things like um esoteric freemasonry martinism um you know other kind of fraternal bodies um so we know that they are doing magical practice in other ways but the divine liturgy provides a kind of um specifically christic sort of um channel um and i think what's also interesting is that the, that valentinian this very valentinian expression of gnosticism is also from my perspective very balancing and very hermetic in its honoring of the physical because if we were completely rejecting the physical and the power and beauty of the physical we wouldn't be using sacraments you know that the sacraments bespeak of um that the, the body and the material can be a vehicle for the divine so i think i think the um, sacramental gnosticism has a very powerful message about that um the second part of your question about you know boundaries in my own practice and whether i class everything i do as gnostic i probably don't i don't i i think i think i i do some practice that is decidedly pagan and i and i would probably feel more comfortable calling it that i have aspects of my practice that are 
um, probably more Buddhist, or as you say, you know, derived from Buddhist traditions. Um, and then I have um, aspects of my practice that are based on kind of more um, kind of Hindu Tantra, but and Western magic combined. But um, and I try and keep them, although they do in my, in the messy Venn diagram of my spiritual practice, they do overlap. Um, you know, the, each of those kind of domains has kind of been based on sort of years of practice. Um, and 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 I, they probably are in dynamic tension with each other. Hence, why my my slightly eccentric take on Gnosticism is is my own. Um, but I hope there's enough there for other people that it's beneficial. Hmm. Yeah, I would definitely say that 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 it is. Uh, unfortunately, Steve, uh, we are getting close to to wrap up time, and uh, it is a real shame that uh, that Bishop Laney wasn't able to make it because I did want to talk to you about Gurdjieff, and actually, she has a strong interest in Norse myth Norse mythology, um, mm -hmm. and I want to talk to you about your therapeutic practice. So, even though we we had some difficulties setting this up, the Archons really didn't want this discussion to happen. I, I hope that we we can defeat them and do do another show so we can talk about those, those fascinating topics in the future. But mm -hmm. in the meantime. Steve, uh, people can find your blog, uh, the blog that you do with uh, with your magical comrades, at the blog of baphomet.com. Is that right? That's right, yeah. And then yeah. the book that I highly recommend that everybody get, which again, it's very reasonably priced. It is short without being flaky. Uh, you should uh, really read it. I, I forgot, we also didn't get into, you know, we talked a bit about contemplation, but we didn't talk about ritual work or some actual practices, but you do have some 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 practices in the book as well. So um, it's, it's there's really quite a, a bit going on for, for a slender tome. So just get it, thank me. Like if, you know, the price is reasonable, bring back some bottles um, and uh, I get a copy um and is there anything else you would, you would like to to tell people to to check out steve who might be interested in your work or what have you sure uh, I, I mean there are it, that so that book is probably uh the first in a trilogy so there's a yeah. book that i co-wrote with julian vane called chaos craft which was looking at chaos magic from a kind of a contemporary witchcraft perspective so that was our that was the first book then agnostics progress there's a, there was a book that I wrote, I think, uh, in 2018 called um, The Heretic's Journey, which kind of expands and explores further into some alternate readings of church history and also surrealism. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Um, if you like the first book, you'll probably like the second book. Um, and I'm currently, I've just completed um, a third book, which is um, called um, Chaos Monastics which looks at monastic traditions, both the new monastic traditions and um, where contemporary magical practice could use the insights of monasticism and contemplation. So um, that that's with the editor, my lovely editor, Nikki Weird. So hopefully that will be out probably at the beginning of next year. Beginning of next year, I, I suspect you will be getting some emails from a sort of Gnostic podcast then, uh, because it sounds like uh, we have uh, so much more to discuss. But uh, Steve, I'm glad that we finally got this to happen. It's been amazing. I will be obsequious once more. People, just just get all of his work, engage with Steve's work. Uh, it's it's great stuff, and I think you'll get a lot out of it. So uh, again, I'm Deacon Jonathan Stewart. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, and we'll see you all later. Bye, everyone. Bye.